So I think we can all agree that that was easily the worst defensive performance of the season for the Florida Gators on Saturday night, right? Let's talk about it on Locked On Gators. You are Locked On Gators, your daily podcast on the Florida Gators. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Locked On Gators, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thanks for making Locked On Gators your first listen of the day. We are available daily and free wherever you listen to the podcast. Happy Monday. I'm Brandon Olson. Find me on Twitter at WNS underscore Brandon. Find my written work with whole nine sports and Giants country of SI.com. Before getting into today's content, just a quick note. Tomorrow's episode of Locked On Gators, Joe Hayden joins the show for the entire show. Uh, it was really cool. It was really fun. I hope you guys enjoy it. Um, but we're going to talk about current defenders now because, yeah, Saturday night against LSU is one of the worst defensive performances we've seen in a very long time from the Florida Gators. And that's saying something because <sighs> Todd Grantham? Was the DC for a bit, uh, and and it was bad. Um, there is no other way to put this than Florida made Jaden Daniels look incredibly good, and that's not even me taking anything away from Jaden Daniels. I have very publicly been not very high on him, but me saying Florida made him look very good, it's just it, it is what it is. He he took what the defense gave him and capitalized on just about every single opportunity. Yes, we could talk about how Jason Marshall's interception got overturned because of a stupid and horrible Javon Dexter roughing the passer call that just made no sense. Like, it's a tackle, dude. It's a tackle. It was was nothing extra. Um, But at the same time, I think we can also acknowledge LSU probably shouldn't have scored 45. Uh, (laughs) Like, LSU is not this incredible high-powered offense. The only other time that they even hit 40 this season was against Southern. So there's that. But Jaden Daniels, 23 of 32 passing, 349 yards, three touchdowns. He also had 14 carries, 44 yards, and three rushing touchdowns. Incredible performance for Jaden Daniels. It was fantastic. And then we talk about what the Gators actually did, which was horrible, by the way. Um, And I will say this, because I've seen it on Twitter. I've seen it in my own comment section. I get it. The Gators looked bad on Saturday. I think most of us accept that the Gators right now genuinely don't have enough talent on their roster. And I'm saying this because we're talking about, a lot of people are talking about, well, they had a bunch of recruits there. They had to see that game and want to decommit, and it looked horrible, and it looked bad. No, most recruits looked at what the Florida Gators put on the field on Saturday night and they said, damn, they sucked. I can come in and play early. Like, I I can do that. And Florida's kind of put their money where their mouth is with that. You got Shamar James playing early, Kamari Wilson playing, Trevor Etienne playing. You've got a lot of young guys playing early on. So Florida's kind of put their money where their mouth is when they say young guys have a path to playing time here. And I think a lot of recruits see that. Uh, Kelby Collins tweeted out after the game. He was like, hey, man, like, like we're going to make an impact. We're locked in. And they should be, especially if you're on the defensive line. There's a ton of improvements to be made up front. And here's the thing also when we talk about recruiting. For months, maybe a year or so, a lot of Gators fans were complaining about Dan Mullins recruiting. And it was like, well... Dan Mullen, he's awful at recruiting. He's not recruiting good players. He's not recruiting recruiting impact players. And then now Billy Napier, Rob Sale, Patrick Tony, and Sean Spencer are the coordinators and play callers here that have the product of that awful recruiting as their roster. And when the players that we said sucked when they were in high school still suck after eight months with a new coaching staff, everybody's mad. Here's the thing. 
in a lot of instances, the players just aren't that good. That's what it is. And I hate being that guy, but that's what it is. I, I mean, up front, defensively, soft. Like, like, Charmin soft. Softness you can see. That's how soft they are. It's despicable there. Um, there's also some things where I was having this conversation on... Uh, I was having this conversation on Discord, actually, with uh, Southern Gator, who, you know, he's Southern Gator. Um, but we were having this conversation about scheme and personnel because he watched the postcast on Saturday after the game, um, which, by the way, locked on Gator's Discord. Description down below, right near the top. Just You can check that out if you want. But we were talking about it, and I think that an issue here is not just whether players are good enough or not, but it's also a matter of there are players that don't necessarily fit the scheme, which falls on the coaching staff, by the way. Because as a coach, it's your responsibility to put the players in the best position to succeed. And that hasn't happened. Um, like I, I brought up Prince Liam and Mialin, who if he's dropping back in coverage, he's almost definitely in a stand-up stance. But also, if he's in a stand-up stance, he's almost definitely dropping back in coverage. Like He doesn't just line up in a two-point stance often. He, he If he does that, it often means he's dropping back, which is an obvious tell, and that sucks. At the same time, there's a lot of players on the team, maybe they're just more comfortable rushing with their hand in the dirt, and they are not comfortable playing stand-up edge rusher. And if they're standing up, it's because they're dropping back. And at that point, why do it? Just have them stand up every play or hand in the dirt every play and don't ask them to drop back into coverage, stuff like that. Here's the thing also that I discussed on Saturday in the postcast um, and in the Discord extensively. Jaden Hill can't play man coverage, and it's to no fault of his own. His knee's just not ready. I said it before the Eastern Washington game, before his comeback, before his debut here. I said... His knee's not ready for man coverage. He needs to play zone. It's not a knock on him. It's just, it's just how his health is working out, how his recovery is working out. I'm sure he's working his damnedest to fix it and get ready, but he's just not ready to play man coverage. He's been targeted incessantly. He's play, I think the number is he's played 63 coverage snaps in the three games he's played. He's been targeted 18 times. That's incredible. Like That is not just coincidence that is these quarterbacks are targeting you like 29 percent 30 percent of your snaps you're getting thrown at no like that's that's something where they're targeting you because they know you're not ready yet they've completed 13 of those passes by the way so it's worked incessantly but he's just not ready to be that man corner zone. Like, he, like he's got to be zone. He can't be man zone and all these other things. He's got to play zone always. Also, I am sorry to say this. I know a lot of Gators fans are going to get mad at this because they do. Jason Marshall Jr. just isn't as good as Gators fans want him to be. He is still good. He is talented as all heck. However... He is not the lockdown number one corner that everybody wants him to be. He's very good, but he's not an eraser. You know, he, he's not going to make receivers disappear, and that's fine. You know, there, it's incredibly rare to find that type of corner. It's incredibly rare to find the Patrick Sertain type of corner. So you're you're just not going to find that right now. But stop talking about him like that because you're doing him a disservice. You are. He, he's just he hasn't been that. And to give him that credit is is wild because it's just going to lead to further disappointment at that point. Um, personnel doesn't fit the scheme. Scheme should be changed to fit the personnel. But third and longs continue to be a major issue for the Florida Gators. And it's honestly, it's so disappointing. I don't know what the heck the game plan was against LSU. Um, it sucked. I could tell you that. I don't know what the thought process was behind it. I will say I've been very openly, you know, the talent just isn't there to have a dominant defense, which is true. No matter how you slice it, the talent's not there to have a dominant defense. But the coaching failed on Saturday against LSU. I, and you can say that the players didn't execute. You could say whatever you want. 
the game plan itself sucked against LSU. So that falls on the coaches, and it's as simple as that. And again, we've got plenty of time to talk more about this and how to fix it and all that. But right now, we're going to talk about the offense just quickly. The numbers don't lie. In the last decade, over 4 million people have chosen Simply Safe Home Security to protect their home, including me, by the way. You don't earn the trust of that many people without doing something right. Right? At Simply Safe, your safety is the only thing that matters. Like I've said, I have it and I love it. And the reason I love it is because I was on vacation uh, one day, you know, this past June, which is very open. Um, I was on vacation, got a notification that someone is by my house, and I was like, that's weird because me. I, like, like no one is living in my house right now. <laughs> like, it's just me. Uh, and, and so that's that. Um, luckily, it was false alarm. It's just neighbors, uh, neighbor's kid's ball came into the yard. So it's fine. But it, it was great because I got the notification, I got the check, and I got that little, that, that sense of comfort there. That I'm like, okay, like, if it was anything, I would have been informed. And that's relieving, you know? You can customize the perfect system for your home in just a few minutes at Simply Safe dot com slash locked on college you save 20 percent on your simply safe security system when you sign up for an interactive monitoring plan and get your first month free visit simply dot com slash locked on college and remember there's no safe like simply safe thanks again for making locked on gators your first listen of the day every day we are available daily and free wherever you listen to podcasts and as we talk about the offense here i'll say this it's hard to to blame the offense in this game at all Um, when you consider, you know, uh, 28 points early on and 35 points total. And, I mean, it's also hard to blame the offense because the defense just kept letting LSU waltz into the end zone. Um, It was, you know, going into this year, Keishon Booty was thought of as this elite top flight receiver, not Jamar Chase-esque, but an elite receiver. And up until the game against the Gators, he didn't look like that. And then the game against the Gators came, and uh, he looked like it. (laughs) He certainly looked like it. But at the same time where I'm saying, you know, it's hard to fault the offense, you can talk about how they just win ghost for a good portion of the game, basically halfway through the second quarter, didn't show up again until end of the third quarter with a minute left they showed up. Also, when you consider that, I mean, looking at the drives just early on, where I was like, oh yeah, Florida scored 21 points early on. You look at those, second play from scrimmage, 51-yard touchdown. Boom. There's quick, quick strike offense. Second drive goes a bit, 10 plays, 75 yards. Third drive, you punt, and LSU muffs the punt again, and you recover as a 12-yard touchdown after that, and then they go ghost until they score another touchdown at the start of the fourth quarter. They showed up, and then, you know, they they had that 81-yard rushing touchdown on the first play of the fourth quarter, Um, which is why I'm saying, like, it's hard to fault the offense, but it's also not hard to fault the offense because they went ghost for way too long. Um, And that's got to be a major concern there. But again, like, the story has been all season for this offense, consistently inconsistent. The defense, consistently bad. Offense, consistently inconsistent. Probably the worst performance by the offensive line as well. Um, Obviously, a major part of that, No Osiris Torrance, who is, I mean, I think undoubtedly the best offensive lineman on this team right now. Uh, No Osiris Torrance. He was suited up and available. He was announced as a starter, didn't play, but right guard Richie Leonard IV took his place, who has been fine in spot starts or maybe not spot starts, but, but rotating in as an offensive lineman. He's been fine, very versatile. He's played left guard, center, right guard. He's an incredibly versatile depth player here but he kind of showed that he's not a starter because LSU's pass rush has been relatively quiet this year. Richie Leonard himself allowed five pressures against LSU. To put that in perspective for 
how drastic of a drop off that is from Osiris Torrance, which by the way, Richie Leonard the fourth was not the only Gators offensive lineman to allow five pressures on Saturday. Uh Richard Garage also did that. So there's that. But to put it into perspective of how major a drop off that was from Osiris Torrance to Richie Leonard the fourth, Osiris Torrance has allowed two pressures all season. Richie Leonard allowed five on Saturday night. That's an insane drop off. Um and again, that's just not really, like that's not really something to work around. That's just a big talent drop off, and that's not a knock on Richie Leonard either. It's also important to talk about how we said this is probably the worst offensive line performance just as a unit this season. That's what happens oftentimes when you have a new person. Because I've said this for so long, and I will always say it: an offensive line, it does not matter the individuals you have on there. Oftentimes, it's a matter of the unit as a whole the the chemistry of the unit you don't have that without osiris torrance because when you're starting someone else that messes with the chemistry not that i mean it could have been better could have been worse it was worse significantly also looking at austin barber and michael tarquin rotating into a couple of possessions there was that i will say i i have some issues with the play calling i liked some of the things they did i didn't like other things I think my biggest gripe with the play calling from Florida versus LSU game, that second play from scrimmage, 51-yard touchdown, Anthony Richardson to Justin Shorter. Deep down the middle of the field, it was a skinny post. We saw it. It was the same play that they started um, Eastern Washington game with. Same play from scrimmage. The Gators did not attempt another pass 20-plus yards downfield after that. There were no passes that went 20 yards past the line of scrimmage after that throw. The second play from scrimmage, and then you just go, well, we had a shot play to start the game, and it worked wonderfully. Why would we do it again? Makes no sense to me. Uh, that is just that, that's, that might be the most egregious, horrible offensive call we've seen this entire season for the Florida Gators. Genuinely, just that decision sucked. It was bad. Uh, then one thing that I did like that they do is Florida used a lot of pre-snap motion. Uh, I, I, I'd have to look at the actual numbers, but I feel like there was more pre-snap motion in the LSU game than any other Gators game this season, which is good. I like pre-snap motion. It helps you identify what the defense is doing. And one of the things was that Florida would use these pre-snap motions with wide receivers as fake, whether it was end around, uh, whether it was a fake sweep, touch pass, whatever you want to call it. And they did that. And they would occasionally give them the ball. And that's what I like because early in the year, we saw they would give them the ball without enough fakes. And then a couple games in, they would do the fakes and not really give them the ball. And against LSU, they kind of worked in an an, an okay mixture of both. Uh, you, You kept them honest. And that's kind of what's important to me. I think that that just showing that you're willing to do whatever it is that you are kind of faking, I think is important because, you know, Georgia's got Georgia's got tape that they're going to watch on this Gators offense. And they're going to go, okay, well, they, they actually will hand it off every now and then. And they're going to have to kind of adjust for that. So I think that this was maybe the best mix of that. We're about to take a look at how recruiting played into or how recruiting might have been affected obviously this past weekend because there was a decommit <gasps> oh no um but first we're gonna have a quick word from bet online because the florida gators were two and a half point favorites heading into the game against lsu and like we've spoken about so much it has continued the LSU, uh, the LSU, the Florida Gators are yet to cover a game or yet to cover the spread in a game in which they're favored. Um, that has been the case in every game they've been underdogs. They have covered in every game that have been favored. They have not. And they have lost two of the games that they were favored in. And so there's that. And if you want to make money on it, because just know that's the trend. Trends don't lie, by the way. And in, in gambling, check out Bet Online. It's your number one source for all of your betting needs and sports information. I made money on it. I'm not going to pretend that I didn't bet 
against that. No, I also had an alt line in case Florida did cover the spread and won by a little bit, which they didn't, but I was prepared. But, you know, I hedged. I don't care. I'll hedge. I don't care. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn all about the trends and action. Check out that online. It's where the game starts. To wrap today's show, we're talking a little bit about recruiting again because there was a decommit for the Florida Gators yesterday. Also, we'll have John Garcia here on Thursday. We're going to go in-depth on some yet-to-be-committed players. We'll talk more about this decommitment. We'll talk about what it might mean for the transfer portal. We'll talk about Gators needing more offensive linemen, more linebackers. Obviously, the two biggest weaknesses right now in this 2023 recruiting class for the Gators. But, yes, there was a decommit yesterday. It was, I mean, three or four star, depending on where you look. Uh, Creed Whitmore, athlete. He's playing quarterback in high school. It's very, there's a lot of option stuff involved in it. He's doing great, by the way. Um but Creed Whitmore decommitted from the Florida Gators yesterday and then committed to Mississippi State, which is interesting because when he decommitted from Florida, I tweeted out, I was like, I wonder if with a relatively strong senior season that he's having right now, if he's getting looks to play quarterback somewhere. I didn't think so because he is on the shorter side. But again, it's college. You could do that. And and I know a lot of people, a lot of UCF fans were like, Gators fans don't even know John Walker was taking that visit to recruit for UCF because they thought that Creed Whitmore was going to commit to UCF because they've seen what John Reese Plumley has done with UCF and everybody knows what Gus Malzahn is fantastic at, which is getting those really athletic quarterbacks to just light up the scoreboard. Um, but then Creed committed to Mississippi State. And again, I was saying maybe he's getting looks at playing QB. Even if, even if Creed is not getting, I mean, he was listed as wide receiver when he committed. Uh, but even if he is, you know, playing quarterback with Mississippi State, or even if he isn't playing quarterback and he is going to be a wide receiver, I don't blame him for decommitting from Florida. He was the second lowest ranked receiver committed, by the way. Um, I don't blame him for decommitting from Florida and then committing to Mississippi State, because Mississippi State, of course, is coached by Mike Leach, who runs the Air Raid. And if you're a dynamic playmaker, Air Raid sounds kind of fun, right? And if, if you're playing the Q, if you're playing QB at the Air Raid, you have to be smart, and you have to know what your checks are and what your calls are. But it's kind of simplified a little bit, and that could help him as well. I don't think he will, but again possibility right what if he hits a growth spurt he's 6'2 6'3 crazy athlete solid arm why not give it a swing but again even if he's playing receiver great for him but I think the bigger thing for Florida fans that they're thinking is Creed Whitmore decommitted from the Florida Gators is this an indicator that Trent Whitmore who's currently on the Florida Gators wide receiver last year had a solid year this year. It's been pretty much hidden. Um, is this a sign or an indication that with his little brother committing or with his little brother decommitting and committing elsewhere, could this kind of foreshadow a potential transfer portal for Trent Widmore? I think it does. Um, I, I do think that Trent, Trent's a transfer risk. But at the same time, that doesn't concern me. We've had our questions about this coaching staff. I don't think you can deny, though, that they will play players that they feel deserve it. I mean, especially a receiver. You look at these guys where you you talk about uh, if a receiver has a good week of practice, if a player has a good week of practice, if they show up, if they work hard, they'll get that playing time, they'll get the reps, they'll get the snap, they'll get whatever they need to do. And Trent Moore has gone ghost. I'm not saying that's an indicator that he doesn't work hard. I'm just saying that whether he's been outworked or whatever, the coaching staff has shown they're willing to play players. I mean, you can look at receiver alone. True freshman Caleb Douglas has played a bit. Marcus Burke has played. Khalil Jackson has played, which, woof, Khalil Jackson. Uh, Jaquavian Frazier's all at receiver have played. Dejon Reynolds has played. And Marcus Burke and Dejon Reynolds are two receivers where Florida fans – 
at certain points thought they'd transfer because of course Marcus Burke was the one that uh, reportedly was getting kicked off the team and then had teammates vouch for him and got brought back. Um, Deshaun Reynolds, of course, was liking tweets about offensive play calling, I think it was at one point. Um, but they, they've they played since then. They've gotten in. So if Trent Whitmore is in some kind of doghouse, I mean, I, I don't care necessarily. Trent Whitmore, he helped last year. This year, he hasn't done anything. He hasn't been on the field. And at receiver especially, this coaching staff has shown that they'll play the people they think are the best. He's not in that group. I don't necessarily care. And it's as simple as that. Thanks for making Lockdown Gators your first listen of the day. Every day we are available daily and free wherever you listen to podcasts. We'll be back tomorrow. Don't forget, Florida Gators legend and Hall of Famer Joe Hayden will be joining the show Check out Locked On SEC for your second listen of the day, hosted by Chris Gore to get the best coverage on the best conference, including the best university, the University of Florida. For Locked On Gators, I'm Brandon Olson. Don't forget to follow me on Twitter at WNS underscore Brandon. Find all my written work with Whole Nine Sports and GiantsCountryofSI.com, and I'll see you all tomorrow.